Kakadu and the Kimberley. Two great areas at the top of Australia. Vast regions of wilderness that are rapidly becoming a mecca for travellers. In part one of this series, Malcolm Douglas and his mate Jack Nixon journeyed to Kakadu and the surrounding country at the end of the wet season. They explored the most inaccessible region on four-wheeled bikes, flew over the wetlands observing the spectacular wildlife, journeyed to the Arnhem Land Escarpment and camped at Jim Jim and Twin Falls. Heading west, they rolled their trailer, travelled across Lake Argyle, hiked into the mysterious Bungle Bungles, and then motored north into the rugged Kimberley Ranges, heading for the Mitchell Plateau. At the King Edward River, they left their vehicle and prepared to continue the epic journey on their bikes. The first bikes are crossed safely. Now for the second one. The plywood used to carry the bikes on the dinghy now makes an extended pack rack. The Land Rover will be left for a few days while the men persevere along the track westward. No one's been this way during the wet and the track's washed out and rough. The trail winds through magnificent stands of Livingstonia palms. Often called fan palms, they're the most striking feature of the plateau. Much of the area was to be mined for bauxite, but the mining companies abandoned the operation, and now this unique area is to receive national park status. 80 kilometres on, it's the end of the track. It's too rocky for the vehicles, so the men continue on foot. Later in the year, during the dry season, this will be a pleasant hike, but now at over 40 degrees, the heat and humidity are oppressive. After camping for the night, they finally reach the falls in the cool of the morning. It's true wilderness. The men are spellbound by the magnificent display below. Malcolm tries to swim across the river to photograph the falls from the far side. A disastrous mistake. In the strong current, his pack fills with water and pulls him under. To save his cameras, he makes an extra effort and just manages to struggle to shore. He's lost all his film, but the Nikon camera can be repaired. The clean mountain fresh water that seeped into the body will dry out within hours and a service will have it working again. But Malcolm stunned. What appeared to be an easy exercise was almost a tragedy. An hour's rest at the falls. And then it's the innovating trek back to the bikes. An agile wallaby, the most common macropod in tropical Australia. In more populated areas, they're often a declared pest, 
But out here in the wilderness, they're a delightful part of the scenery. Within a few years, this region, like the Bungle Bungles, will see a huge increase in visitors. With no rain for a week, the King Edward River's dropped again, so it's an easier crossing this time back to the Land Rover. On the run south, Malcolm calls in to see his Aboriginal friends at Mount Barnet Station, where they're breaking in a mob of horses for the dry season cattle muster. These tribesmen have a marvellous rapport with stock, and breaking in is done gently, with quiet determination. These Aboriginal stockmen are so well respected that horses are sent from surrounding stations to be broken in at Mount Barnet. Placid mare is brought in to reassure the lassoed horse while the hobbles are secured. Come on, man. Come on. Come on. And now bagging begins. A totally new experience. Surprisingly, the animals calm down very quickly. The bridle with extended rein soon has each horse moving and turning on command. <laughs> By mid-afternoon, only hours after the horses were lassoed for the first time, they're ready for the saddle. This is the most testing moment. The leg rope's free, and away they go. A few token bucks and both horse and rider relax. After a feed, they're yarded for the night and will be ridden again in the morning. Eight hours earlier, this grey was wild and unbroken. Now it's ready for the stock camps. Without the local Aborigines, many of the Kimberley stations would find it difficult to muster. The men enjoy the hot, dangerous, dusty work. These cattle on Mount Elizabeth Station will be drafted and sent to Broome for slaughter and export to America for hamburger meat. On Mount Elizabeth today stands an old homestead, a memorial to Frank Lacey and his wife who settled this country in the 1940s, raised a family and established a successful cattle station. They built their home from local timber, stone and ant bed the original roof was thatched. In summer, the temperature soars to over 40 degrees in the kitchen. The old house is now a fascinating piece of Kimberley history. These days, Frank's son Peter runs the station from a new homestead 20 kilometres away. Peter can now check his cattle in hours from the air, a job that would have taken his father weeks on horseback. Back at Napier Range, Malcolm detours to Winjana Gorge, a special place. Over millions of years, the Leonard River has cut through the limestone to form a spectacular canyon several kilometres long. The river flows for short periods during the wet season before subsiding into tranquil, permanent pools. 
These water holes support big populations of harmless freshwater crocodiles. The gorge is a sanctuary for huge flocks of corellas. Their raucous screeching amplified by the sheer walls. Malcolm and Jack head for Broome, to Malcolm's Crocodile Park and Research Centre. It's Easter and the tourists have arrived in town, enjoying the first dry season weather after the hot, muggy wet. Feeding time always attracts big crowds, when the general public can see huge crocodiles at close quarters. Malcolm's established this centre to educate people about crocodiles and make them more aware of our most unique reptile. A known predator of man, crocodiles have a fearsome reputation. When crocodiles in the wild become a problem, Malcolm's asked by government authorities to capture them. He transports the reptiles to Broome for display and research purposes. Even though there have been several crocodile attacks recently in North Australia, Malcolm does not believe that they should be shot to extinction, an argument put forward by some sections of the public. With feeding tours and lectures, Malcolm hopes that people will leave his park with more respect and a better understanding of the world's largest living reptile. When the crowds have gone, Malcolm has time to yarn with Mark Johnston, the park's manager. Malcolm's particularly interested in one of his latest acquisitions, a young American alligator. Crocodiles are often called alligators, or simply gators, but there are no alligators in the wild in Australia. The dark-skinned reptile on the right is the alligator, from southern USA. Our saltwater or estuarine crocodile does not have such a wide head. A quick note of its growth rate, and it's back into the pen. Malcolm and Mark are vitally interested in conserving the species, and they're now breeding crocodiles. After 90 days incubation, the eggs are ready. The parents are very protective of the nest, so heavy mesh keeps them at bay. The female is exceptionally aggressive. In the wild, when the babies are due to hatch, they call out and the mother responds, uncovering the nest. In captivity, however, the babies must be removed to another pond for their own protection. The vocalising of the first croc to hatch triggers off a similar response in the other young. And they all leave the nest together. At times, the mother picks up an egg and gently crushes the shell with her teeth to release the tiny crocodile. All hatchlings have a minute tooth they use to chip open the shell. It falls out within days. Here at the croc park, the keepers often help the babies out. They survive for the first week or two on a yolk sac, and if they don't learn to feed by the time the sac's absorbed, they die of starvation. The sex of a crocodile is determined by the temperature of the nest. A higher temperature produces males. A cooler nest results in females. These babies could live for 100 years and grow to seven meters.
two minutes old and already aggressive. Nearby, another strange natural occurrence. Processionary caterpillars on the move. Much is still to be learnt about this family of insects. It's believed that they form a line as a defence while travelling to new feeding areas. A solid line looks formidable to a predator, although their hairy bodies are protection enough. Most bush animals leave these creatures alone, and humans can suffer irritating skin rashes from the prickly hairs. There are over 200 individuals in this lineup. Mark and I are just having a look at the charts to see where we have to go up the coast. The Department of Conservation and Land Management have rung us and said, could we go up to two of the bays north from Broome to trap two rogue crocodiles? Now, trapping crocs is always a very exciting and exhilarating task. We love doing it, but it's also very time consuming because in the past we've had to set up rope snares. So this year we're going to try a different technique. We going to go into the garage and build up large metal traps and hopefully these metal traps will be a lot easier for us to use and less stressful for the animal after it's caught and after we winch it out of the water and transport it all the way down to Broome. But before we can head up the coast, we've got to make the traps. It's a busy time organising all the gear for a crocodile trapping expedition up the coast. Jack keeps the welder going for days building the traps. It's his last job with Malcolm before going south to run a mustering camp. Within a week, the huge metal traps are ready. And the team head for Willy Creek and Disaster Bay. Well, here we are at Willie's Creek. We've just set up our first trap. Now, we've placed the trap on the bank at low tide. We can either leave it here or we can float it out in the middle of the river on drums. Now, how does a trap work? Well, you see down in here, we've got a bag full of fish and running from the bag is a rope. Now, we follow the rope right down to the other end of the trap where the gate is, now the gate's open, we've got a pin holding up the gate. So on the rising tide, the croc will come up here, he'll smell the bait, he'll enter the trap, and he'll grab the bag and try and get the fish. And of course, as he pulls the bag, the pin will pull out like this. Down will come the gate, we've caught our crocodile. We've got a radio transmitter here, it switches on, as soon as the gate drops, so signal goes back to our camp, we pick it up on our receiver, we come straight down, pick up the cage and winch it onto the trailer and take the crocodile straight back to Broome. Two days later, the trap's still empty. The croc could have left Willie Creek, so they reload the trailer and head north. Malcolm and Mark attach the floats and check the trap's buoyancy. Now the traps have to be transported to Disaster Bay, 20 nautical miles to the south. One trap's carried on a chartered barge, the second on the runabout. At the end of the wet, the days are always clear and the seas calm. When the team reach the mangrove line river, it's late afternoon and they lose no time setting the trap. Two dead chickens are the bait. The trap's left for the night. In the morning, the gate's down. They must have a croc.
After towing the trap to the bank, Malcolm has to rope the croc's jaws to secure them. And that's not as easy as it looks. With the rope in place, Malcolm works quickly for the incoming tides now flooding the mangroves. With its jaws secure, the croc stops struggling long enough to move it to the boat. Malcolm's had an urgent call to trap some problem crocs on the Ord River. So the stinking bait's removed and they pack up and head for the Ord, over 1,000 kilometres away. Leaving the captured croc in Broome, Malcolm and Mark arrive at the old Ord crossing. The whole area has been quarantined where the Agricultural Protection Board's trying to eradicate a noxious weed, Nagura burr. The burr cutters are having problems with some rogue crocs. The burr cutters camp on the bank of the Ord River is deserted. The men are on leave until the crocs are caught. We finally reached the Ord River and I'm sitting in the dinghy that caused all the fuss. We're up in Disaster Bay trapping. We've got this radio message to come straight up here and we've driven into the quarantine area where the chaps are cutting the Nagura burr. Now as they row across the river each morning, they pass this really big croc. He's usually just sunning himself on the sandbar. No problem. They lose quite a few of their dogs. They lost two here in the last six or eight weeks, but that didn't concern them. But the other morning they came down and his dinghy was sunk. And of course they thought that the bung had been left out of the bottom. And when they checked it out, pulled it out of the water, down the back here, two big tooth marks. What had happened, the croc come up during the night, decided to have a chomp at the dinghy. And that's the problem. Once you have crocodiles that start taking a liking to aluminium dinghies, well then you've got to move the crocodiles. So what we have to do now is set our traps along the river here and hopefully in a day or two we'll have a couple of big crocs. There's an urgency to set the traps by sundown. Bagged smelly meat is the bait. In the morning, Malcolm checks the river for crocs, then heads for a particular trap. A good-sized croc lies doggo. First, he removes the radio transmitter. Then comes the dangerous job of transporting the croc to Broome. The croc, knowing it cannot escape, lies quite still. Stop. Yeah. To fit such a large reptile into the truck, the men have to winch the trap off the ground and position the vehicle. It's a tense and exhausting time for the men and the croc. Once the creature's secured in the vehicle, Mark will drive continuously a thousand kilometres back to Broome so the crocodile can be settled again as quickly as possible. Saltwater crocodiles are incorrectly named because they also live in freshwater. A favourite habitat is this section of the Ord, the quarantine area. There's a plentiful supply of food, especially birds and cattle. Waiting for Mark to return, Malcolm continues to trap where the burr cutters row across the river. Another croc. It's just been caught and it's wild.
A smaller croc taken from a trap earlier is relocated downstream and released. Crocodiles are protected and there are heavy fines imposed on anyone killing them. Malcolm understands crocodiles and is able to handle them safely. He's the only person in Western Australia with a permit to trap problem crocs. have to turn him around, I think. Nearby are black-headed pythons on the move. A magnificent species easily recognised by the shiny black head and neck. It's an inoffensive, non-venomous snake that's common right across North Australia. Because of its unique appearance, it's often killed, mistaken for venomous species. By the time Mark returns, all the problem crocodiles have been trapped and it's exhausting work moving them to the trailer. The new traps have been an outstanding success. These metal cages are a very humane way of catching and relocating these dangerous reptiles. All right, now that he's in there. It's a long 18-hour trip back to Broome and into their new home. If these crocs are not caught, they have to be shot. Here in Broome, they'll settle in to live contentedly for 80 years or more. Two hundred kilometres north of Broome, Malcolm and Mark are preparing for yet another expedition. North along the Kimberley coast, assessing crocodile numbers. This coast, with its countless bays, islands, and cliff locked harbours, is a fascinating part of Australia. Malcolm has journeyed into this wilderness many times, but for Mark, it's a first. And they're heading for Malcolm's favourite spot. The incredible gorges of Talbot Bay. A series of bays gradually decreasing in size, the last two connected by narrow channels. It's safe to enter only on the tide changes. The last bay is almost landlocked. The entrance only a few metres wide. Malcolm and Mark have a feed while the tide's building. And Mark and I have just reached the tidal gorges of Talbot Bay. Now, I've been coming here for 20 years and I filmed it before, but I make no apologies for filming it again because these tidal gorges would be one of the most spectacular natural wonders that I've ever seen. In fact, I'd say the Bungle Bungles over near Halls Creek and these tidal gorges are two of the most spectacular things that I've ever seen in my 25 years travelling Australia. Now, we're going to stay in here till the tide turns so we can get out. We're going to use the boat, we're going to climb up. We're going to try slow motion, we're going to try all different angles so I can show you just what these tidal gorges are all about. The tide surges through the narrow opening with immense power, rising over 10 metres within six hours.
This remarkable natural feature is so remote that it's been seen by only a few people. Giant whirlpools build, break up, and reform as Mark powers forward trying to motor closer to the entrance. After several hours of this wild turbulence, it settles, just for a few minutes before surging out again with a dropping tide. Truly one of Australia's best kept secrets. Leaving the tidal gorge, the men travel far to Walcott Inlet, a low, muddy, primeval place, the home of crocodiles and bats. Common right across North Australia, these flying foxes often roost among the mangroves. When disturbed, their raucous shrieking is almost deafening. The camp's perimeter is guarded by old males who fly into the main camp to give the alarm at the approach of danger. Close up, a flying fox has a pretty face with delicate features and bright eyes. Near the rookery, saltwater crocodiles lurk, waiting patiently for the old and the very young to fall into the water. Many kilometres from the open sea, the country changes dramatically. Malcolm and Mark motor into a towering chasm. Above soars one of Australia's most regal birds, a white-breasted sea eagle. tide, the men unpack. Daily surveys will help them become familiar with the river and they'll be able to check the crocodile population by night. The tide's soon rushing again and that's a sign the barramundi will be on the move. Mark's never caught a barra, but he soon hooks something big. It's a great fish and will be enough for several meals. The fillets are wind dried, so very little is wasted. Malcolm and Mark explore the areas above tidal influence. Saltwater crocodiles breed in these long stretches of fresh water. A freshwater monitor The increasing number of rock jams make it difficult to continue and Malcolm realises that a night survey would be impossible. Even by day it's just too rough. It's time for a feed.
Seeking shelter in a cave, Malcolm prepares a heap of hot coals. Outside the cave, an old goanna has picked up the smell of cooking. Late in the afternoon, the men return to base. After dark, the serious task of spotlighting for crocs begins. They note the number of mature crocs, but only the hatchlings are netted. In the wild, most baby crocs are taken by predators or die of starvation, and only a very small percentage survive their first 12 months. Malcolm has a permit to collect 30 for research. And it's a long, arduous night. Many crocs are seen, but only the smallest taken. By sunup, they're worn out and grab an hour's sleep. With too much gear in the boat, Mark settles for the gently rocking inflatable. A bush spa created by the dropping tide is a great way to freshen up. Before moving camp, Mark gets lunch. Twenty kilometres away is the Isdell River, another area that has to be surveyed. The sheer cliffs and muddy bank at low tide make it extremely difficult to find a place to cook the fish and boil the billy. It takes a keen sense of adventure, a love of the wilderness, and a determination to learn more about crocodiles to put up with these conditions. Malcolm, with his bag full of billies, is keen to have that cover. Mark's dog, Boof, jumps from the boat and sticks in the mud. Reluctantly, he clambers after Malcolm to high ground. After a feed, the team walk far up the gorge. It's a hot, innovating trek. They make for the upper reaches above tidal influence. This is one of Australia's most inaccessible gorges. Further inland is Unknown Wilderness, a unique region of spectacular beauty. Malcolm believes this whole area should receive national park status. 
Here, barramundi are the most plentiful species. But for a change, Mark takes a mangrove jack for tea. After dark, they're out surveying the river again. Crocodiles have been protected in this area now since 1970, and they're gradually making a comeback after being almost shot to extinction. It will be many years before the crocodile populations are restored to a satisfactory level. All the baby crocodiles caught will thrive in captivity. In the wild, their chances of survival are slim. With the baby crocs well protected, it's a weary few days travelling back to Broome. It's been a rough trip for the babies. But surprisingly, they all look reasonably strong. They've lost some condition, so they're force-fed. Minced fish is gently eased down their throats. With full stomachs, they're released into their new home. Together with the crocodiles bred at the park, they'll be studied for many years. Such essential information will guarantee the survival of these prehistoric reptiles. Take a little of the Kimberley. A marvellous trip and a great experience. It's my last morning, I'm just packing up, ready to head back to Sydney. There's only one thing that saddened me about the whole trip is right from Kakadu, right through to the top end of the Kimberley, everywhere I've been, there's more and more people moving in and every year there's more and more rubbish being left behind. Now this country is unique. There's nothing else like it in the world. So please, when you come up here, Come in, enjoy it, look at it, only leave your footprints. Pick up all your junk, pick up all your garbage and take it away. Let's look after this country. Let's keep it for our kids and our grandchildren and for all the future generations after that. But please, pick up your rubbish and take it out.